Hello and welcome to the Xenothesis podcast. My name is Richard Acton and my co-host... Michael Glinka, welcome. Uh, uh, we uh, met uh, doing biology PhDs and uh, this podcast is going to be covering a, a, a book uh, a book called Dawn, which is the first of the Xenothesis trilogy, uh, sorry, uh, Xenogenesis trilogy um, by Octavia Butler, um, also released under Lilith's Brood as a single collection. So uh, the premise is that I've read these books before, uh, but uh, Michael hasn't. So uh, And I haven't, so it's going to be an adventure for me, where we I'm going to read the chapter by chapter by chapter, and then uh, make out my predictions. In the meantime, we're going to discuss the science and the literature premise and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the sort of inspiration that I was drawing from from these podcasts were a couple of podcasts from, from Doof Media. Uh, we've got Worm, which covered the web serial Worm by uh, John McRae, also known as Wild Bow, with Matt Freeman and Scott Daly. And then uh, uh, We Want More, uh, which covered Ellie Isiodkowski's um, web serial Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, which is hosted by Stephen Zuber and Brian Deacon. Um, and they both um, you know, discussed sort of those uh, um, web serials, not books uh, as such, um, uh, in this kind of format where one of them has read it before, the other one hasn't. They go through chapter by chapter, try not to, to spoil the person who's not read it, and you know, discuss, analyze, um, talk about the uh, both the literary components of it and some of the um, interesting bits of... Uh, uh, culture or science that are covered by the book uh yeah so we thought we're gonna we want to try this ourselves and since our um, knowledge in science biology and general uh well more or less quite good general knowledge on other fields of science uh, science medicine chemistry we thought it'd be nice mm. to apply the science in the science fiction so track yeah. how close can we get with current medicine uh -huh. and current science to what the science fiction uh, in the books mm. we can find in the books and the, the choice of of the xenogenesis trilogy for uh, for this project was kind of uh, inspired by the fact that I, I thought the biology in this was actually really interesting i thought it was a sci-fi series that kind of did biology justice in a way that um a lot of other sci-fi kind of uh, gets physics and chemistry kind of on the nose but sometimes screws up the biology uh, but it's you know uh, sometimes i feel, feel like this the physics and chemistry like are really well sort of thought of hmm. but then biology is way beyond like the, the sort of scope of what the uh, um, way to more in future, more futuristic than compared to what chemistry and physics yeah, uh, describe. Yeah. And, and there's there's a certain um, and a, but biology is such a complex field that there's a kind of weird barrier to entry that is slightly mm. different from the others. It's yes, harder yes. to to get um, like boned up by reading the Wikipedia pages. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, if you, I mean, there are so many Wikipedia pages that you can dive into, and you probably won't understand any of it because of the scientific lingo and yeah, so much the necessary background knowledge you need to have. Mm. So, what we will try is to uh, explain some stuff in biology uh, through biology, applying the biology to uh, the science fiction, but mm. we will try to make it less scientific or be more approachable yeah yeah absolutely explain yeah. it as much as we mm. can um and if anything yeah. we'll probably we'll leave some references for people to read uh, yeah each although time. you know optional right you don't have to get oh, you don't, of course we're, you can. we're not going to give you a biology to go. degree you don't have to go it's, <laughs> if you're not it's just interested in listening that's perfectly fine yeah um so i was going to give a, a little background on on the author um octavia butler um because she, she's quite interesting um, she's uh, an American science fiction author. She was uh, born in uh, 1947 and died in 2006 at only 58. Um, so she was born in Pasadena, California, um, and uh, was an only child from the age of seven, born into kind of pretty modest economic circumstances, judging by her parents' professions. Her dad was a shoeshine man and her mother was a housemaid. 
So she was raised by her, her maternal grandmother and her mother uh, in a fairly strict Baptist environment, although she later described herself as a former Baptist, so apparently she left that. Uh, she's uh, dyslexic and very shy as a child, um, and apparently also loved uh, books on tape because she was kind of a slow reader. So uh, I didn't know this about her until I did a little bit of background research, so it explains a little bit more about why I like her work, because I feel she's a kindred spirit. Um, uh, yeah, um, she was um, uh, at community college when the Black Power movement was quite big. Um, I don't think I mentioned that she was black, but she's black. Um, uh, yeah, um, although apparently she was a bit of a contrarian there. She had some um, uh, disagreements with, with people. Um, mm. yeah, well, it, I think yeah. it's um, that disagreement of people is shown through the way her, the critics were describing her hmm. as very evocative and often going to uh, troubling topics such as, you know, um, race, sex, powers, and Absolutely, power. Yeah. So it's, hmm. I think... Um, I mean, she was very popular. Her, so, yeah. S sorry. No, I was just saying that it was just, it's it shows in the books that, you know, in her books that, um, although I'm just only started reading her books, so yeah, yeah. you know more than I, but from what critics are saying that it shows her character shows in her books. Yeah, yeah. I, I, she, she comes across as a very kind of astute people watcher in her writing, right? She's definitely observed and uh, uh, kind of understood the way people tick. Um, it, it's a yeah, an interesting perspective. But uh, she was she was quite popular with a sort of a feminist audience at the time, um, although that was kind of. Uh, she was writing when second wave feminism was still big, so uh, there's a few topics in there. Eventually, we'll get to them. That I think her handling of them is sufficiently nuanced that the third and fourth wave feminists might be a bit less comfortable with her work. Okay. Okay. But yeah, I'll 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 just leave that there and yeah, yeah, trust the internet. I will. To... You know, once we get to that point, we can discuss it more. In yeah, detail. yeah, we can discuss that more. But yeah, I, I, I'm gonna mention feminism on the internet, and then you know. Trust it to to discuss to that in a dis mature, not to, not to go bore, uh, fully, uh, you know, yeah. explode and basically. But hey, maybe it's a good way to promote uh, the <laughs> our <laughs> podcast. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, mm, yeah. That, that <laughs> <work>. <laughs> right. Shall we start with the chapter? Or uh, yeah, show yeah. The book? Um, let's let's actually dive in. So, um, so will, chapter one. Chapter one. Um, should I introduce it then? Start yeah, go ahead. So, in this chapter, um, we meet a character of Lilith, um, a person we don't know anything about, except that she's being um, trapped somewhere, uh, kept in prison, and a series of experiments are being uh, performed on her. And we know this because each time she, des she describes them as awakenings, each time she wakes up. And we know of this because of the sp uh, scars on her body, uh, which also suggested that um, her somebody or something is performing some sort of surgery or body modification experiments on her. Hmm. Uh, but we don't know what they are. We just know uh, we're looking through her perspective um on when she awakes and how the time passes even though she's unaware of how much time has actually passed between each time she wakes up um, but she does describe her surroundings to us and we know that um she's in sort of prison cell um she's given food and water she is mm -hmm. required she's given place to sleep and wash but there's no exit uh, or no way to see outside except for if i understood correctly plastic ceiling but yet still um, she couldn't see anybody uh, around that uh, in that area. And from what we see from the description, it's quite a futuristic place. So there's, as she describes, there's no source of light or ventilation um, or sound. And yet, like the walls are described as being the source of the light and the ventilation and the sound when, whenever somebody, the, her captors are speaking to her. Um, she's also given clothes and these are, I think we'll discuss them a bit later, but, mm -hmm. um, those clothes, uh, were given to her, uh, be, uh, 
delicate as a silk but behave like velcro even though they don't have any velcro they once she puts them on they cling to her body and they close but without any visible ways um indicating quite a futuristic design of hmm. um, those uh, of the materials um and so far in the chapter one i th- as i believe we'll discuss two chapters uh, due to the length of uh, of the chapters yeah um in the f- chapter one um she um describes how she initially was trying to strike conversation with the, her captors but nobody ever really responded to her um, in any way uh, except for asking her questions so at some point she decided to be completely rebellious against them and not respond to them or just swearing at them basically which yeah, I yeah. personally can quite personally uh, uh, respond to that I would do that same yeah I mean uh, it sounds like they kind of basically kept her in like solitary confinement for extended periods yes. and she was um, like losing her mind Yes. so yeah. Uh, yeah if mm. if you know if you're only given questions and no any answers i assume anybody would go rebellious um mm-hmm. no matter how peaceful of person you are yeah i mean this is a position of sort of extreme powerlessness right you're just in a room mm. with like no visible doors it's just and then you could all you have is like questions from the ceiling and they all they do is ignore you it's like yeah yeah it's pretty, it just feels and also feels yeah. really claustrophobic if you think yeah. about it because you're locked and i mean as the character of um apologies, i don't know if i had told her name by her name was lilith the main character yeah. name lilith, lilith iapo yeah and um she seemed to be fine but i can imagine a this being a complete hell for a claustrophobic person mm. because must be incredibly, incredibly uh, scary to mm. be blocked in this uh, small confinement for unknown amount of time. Yeah. Uh, do, do you want to talk about her, her name at all? Because there's a couple of... Uh, we, we drew out some stuff there. Yeah, so that, we uh, I looked into sort of... Often authors try to put some meaning behind people's names. So I, hmm. I, I think we both looked into her meaning of her name. Yeah. And in um, for what I found was that um, Lilith, the origin of name Lilith, comes hmm. from Jewish folklore. Uh, Jewish mythology and yeah. it indicates the name of Adam's uh, first wife. So obviously, from mm. the Bible, many Although people the, know the the addition of the Adam's first wife bit is actually it's a later it's it's a medieval edition. Uh, mm-hmm. It's kind of a retcon for uh, resolving the differences between Genesis one and Genesis two, where okay. you've got the like the uh, in, in Genesis one um, Adam and and his wife are created from like the same material mm-hmm. uh, and then in, in two uh, his wife is created subsequently so there was a uh, this notion of a first wife of adam um, that later got um, the the name lilith attached to her um, in the medieval period uh, oh i see okay yeah um because mm. from what uh, from what Basically, you can look in the Bible. Is basic. You can tell that when Adam was created, Eve was created from his rib, but mm. she was not counted as his sort of first wife as such, um, because they were created for each other. But then, when they were kicked out from the paradise, that's mm. when I think God created Lilith, according to yeah. what I read. Uh, and there's this well, there's this kind of popular notion of, of Lilith as um, like. Uh, uh, kind of rebellious woman or, or like mm. a more dominant woman um, and you know Adam kind of rejecting that or her um, leaving not being happy in the kind of subservient role as a uh, as a theme yes, associated yes. with that and there was something yeah. about um, being her being really rebellious not fulfilling the wife's position mm. uh, as such indicating the first sort of like early stages st- steps of showing how women should be subservient to men but according to mythology she later sort of um was described as um according she had a relationship with one of the archangels and her offspring offsprings were called Mm. succubi 
in order. Ah, so, yes, yeah. There's a whole whole mythology around sort of Lilith as a, a female demon in various contexts. And, it's incredible, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. When yeah. you look into a, when <laughs> we have a early sort of rebellious woman, and they already told her she was sleeping, co- creating demons out of her womb. It's incredible. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then um her second name iapo um which uh, apparently means many hard situations in the yoruba language from the, the uh the nigeria i think nigerian benin kind of region um yeah. so, so uh, I, th- I think um yeah. it's 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 pretty i think so far what i've seen it, it sort of explains her character in a way hmm. you can yeah, it's it very fitting character. right yeah um, but in the book as well, um, she was described in the um, more about her herself when she described that she was married. Uh, mm-hmm. We know, and she had a son, um, two brothers and sister. But probably her whole family was dead. Um, so we we can, from what she can, we can assume from the book that she'll be on her own on from this point. Um, no. I only just reread it, but I, I've I've forgotten already. Uh, how, do we know much about how um, they died or the kind of no, circumstances? No, I think from yeah. the f- first chapter, they only talk about you know the whole premises that start a war started on the on the earth, and hmm. um, but it doesn't really describe how. Yeah. Okay. So the, there's this uh, war, and how, do we know much about that war? Nope. I think no. it's just um, at this very moment, for at least as much as I have uh, read to mm-hmm. both chapter one and two, it doesn't really describe what happened during the war. It only described mm-hmm. that some people ra- uh, escaped to underground, but um, that's it. But we'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so uh, basically, we just have the the circumstances of her kind of in this weird, futuristic, solitary confinement cell. Um, in chapter one and kind of ruminating on the fact that most of the people that she knew are probably dead uh yeah so that's um, so it's not it's, a great start a, from her yeah although in the first chapter we also introduced to a character of a young boy um i think hmm. he was six year old boy named Sharad. oh yes um who couldn't speak her language and she couldn't speak his language. Um, he was put in his in her cell for a certain amount of time before between her awakenings. Hmm. And of course, as in, she grew close to him because considering not being um, uh, able to speak to anyone except for her captors, actually having physical contact with anything, anyone would bring anybody close uh, to each other. Yeah. And um, we know initially that he was scared of her, but eventually, with time, they managed to grow closer to to each other, try to explain each other, and learn teach each other languages um, to sort of be able to communicate. Hmm. So, at that point, um, we know that there are other humans uh, yep. in the hmm. form of uh, Sharad. But then he disappears again. Yeah, so it's kind of a weird thing, right? You get some random child put in your cell with you. Not being able to talk to you. You cannot understand him or he can understand you. And then suddenly once you finally manage to make some contact, he disappears. He's being taken away. Taken away, yeah. And you're kind of back and forth out of this like suspended state where you're being put asleep and then woken up again and i think is there a, there's a description of her like waking up from this um suspension right where it's quite uh like um a stressful kind of experience mm. uh, yeah it's i mean to be honest um from what she describes the her first away in the awakening was uh first few awakenings were divorced because she would wake up um, hmm. and then find scars on her body hmm. and the question was where did they come from um, and I can imagine that the distress uh, but I was thinking a bit more about 
like the the physical aspects of it i think that she described like a heart was beating really fast or something like that so that, that it's not like a normal waking up from sleep it's oh, a yes, yes. more uh profound kind of suspension yeah um uh, so i think um this was this is basically the chapter one it's a short chapter hmm. um how many words do they have um according to my count 2178 so a very short chapter um and we're just given background and at the time um i thought we may stop at this chapter so i made my predictions for the chapter two hmm. uh but then realized maybe it'd be better to talk about um, yeah a bit more content content yeah. so we decided hmm. to go on a chapter two but i think it'll be a good idea to do predictions but um Science wise, in the chapter, we biological wise, we don't really, hmm. we are not in really interested in anything except for the futuristic sort of cell, yeah. um, which the, we already described. Although, did you, did you read anything to the description of the, the bed as like growing out of the floor? No, actually, I, I just imagined it as being a, um, you know, an elevated sort of like, uh, you know, bit of bit of floor if you know what mm. i mean and then with a sort of cover on top of it i didn't really look into that um um th- that much and then there was why. the the edible bowl that like disintegrated if you didn't eat it oh yeah there was it it was there um, yeah, it's a couple of these little like tiny little cues that kind of hint at the like otherness of the technology that's true. That's, I, I, I didn't think about the, the ball until you actually mentioned it. Yes, because it was a description mm. that if she did, refused to eat, it would just disintegrate itself. Mm. Huh. Interesting. Mm. Well, maybe uh, investigate that more at a later stage, or at least I mm. hope. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't think I'm I'm being too like uh, spoilery here because I, I I mentioned to Michael before we started reading this that uh, like the biological nature of of the sort of technology that exists in this book so he's kind of he's already aware of, of that element of things yeah of course yes yeah. Uh, we had a discussion and uh, i'm sort of mm. i sort of know what it's about more mm. or less uh of course i don't know the details uh, but what richard described it to me the books um sound really interesting and i and i can't wait to be honest to look into more chapters to um to see what the actual science what they do know will be there but we'll get mm. there Hopefully, yes. And uh, to go back to one other thing on that point, did you read anything else into the the whole um, uh, like non Velcro Velcro clothes? So I've um, I haven't looked into a specific materials as such, but it reminds me of sort of um, those materials uh, similar to um, uh, uh, graphene. Hmm. Um, where graphing, for example, mats were designed to put you where you can sort of put anything on, like you can glue them on this on this wall, right? Yeah. And you can put like vast amount of weights on top of them, like without any sort of uh, sealant you know, for any form. Oh, yeah, basically yeah. Like the, a, a monatomic sheet of graphene yes. can support the weight of a cat. Yeah, so it's it's incredible. So basically, mm. you you know, and even if it's it was a vertical wall, um, you could it's from certain angle put a a washing machine on a me one meter by one meter uh, sheet of huh. graphene. Okay, and basically it wouldn't fall down because of the electrostatic. This is like a kind of Van der Waals forces thing. Sort of, yes, yes. So yeah. basically, I sort of imagine it being very similar to that, where you have mm. that contact to contact of this this material basically causing this sort of um yeah that that was very much what it implied to me it kind of implies this like uh, ability to do almost nanoscale materials engineering because you know you can get that kind of well you've not got this issue of these like macroscopic hooks to actually physically grab onto stuff but it's you know exploiting something smaller mm. to get that effect yeah so I'm I'm curious about what like what material it is because it sounds um sounds interesting something like mm. I'm sure will probably be will be in use in the next few decades 
in our world. Yeah, uh, I expect it will be. Yeah, um, that, that kind of um, material science. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of work in that area, right? Trying to make materials where mm. we have like nearly um, light, uh, more durable, level. easier to yeah. manufacture. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, if you look into um, nowadays shoes, you know, recently Nike released uh, new trainers that are considered almost a like a cheat um, tool for athletes. So uh, I think, I think there's I a consideration that, yeah. to ban those uh, shoes. I don't remember the name of mm. them. You can easily find them because there are a lot of articles yeah, yeah. about this. About, mm. but basically they have discussion with a graph uh, graphing sort of sheet inside of them, and it's so spongy, I would say, or like uh, springy. Okay, so that springy, basically yeah, yeah. makes mm. the person who running much. It makes it easier mm. and much um, uh, less. So it's like the um, the whole uh, debate over the like. Um, elasticity of blades in in the paralympic competition right that was that whole thing with the paralympic sprinters yes like, were yes, they effectively like that. doping with it yeah so okay, it's sort cool. of not biological doping but sort of a mechanical doping cool doping here. yeah hmm. um so this is something hmm. probably which we'll uh, experience more in the future such a such thing as mechanical doping, you mm. know, um, yeah. as you know, the how do you call it, the speedo um, swimming gear used for by swimmers, Olympic swimmers. Oh yeah. Uh, the shark sort of skin type of uh, swimming, you know, also was mm. I think considered um, banned, or is it banned? Maybe I would have to. Check I don't know that. about that one. But, um, but basically, yeah. because it allowed a smoother water mm. um, flow. Um, yeah, all these kind of little cool material science tricks that exploit kind of nanoscale features of the material. But many of um, them are based on uh, nature. I mean, if you yeah, look at the a lot of biometrics. Um, and nature, you can find materials like the shark skin that hmm. you know, once way if you cross your hand, it's super smooth. But if you go against other against it, it's very rough and like sandpaper. Um, yeah. So. All of these sort of uh, nowadays medicine, synthetic medicine, and a lot of um, uh, materials and um, structural design is also for um, coping nature. Honeycomb design mm. was considered mm. one of the strongest uh, designs, light and strong. Um, we can reduce the amount of material used while maintaining the strength of it. So yeah, absolutely, it's it's. I think, but uh, back to the being the uh, back to the book. I think hmm. clothes like that will be designed quite. I I think we have next ten twenty years that we will see. Yeah. Uh, possibly, yeah. I mean, uh, the the main barrier to kind of that um, sort of material, I think, is the manufacturing difficulty mm. of of getting something that is where well, you have that degree of control over the the sort of nanoscale structure of the material. Um, in, in something as large as a you know an actual garment, um, that's where the the tricky bit comes in. Like having uh, macroscopic objects with nanoscale features. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but I think eventually we will probably get to the point where, due to possibly resource a limit, we'll have to mm. the amount of material provided will be so limited to. It, that will be like you know it's will be calculated to the nanograms of material use for uh, whatever trousers shirt uh, <laughs> the person can wear. Uh, well, yeah, I suppose it will very much depend on the economics of the situation. Yeah, of but course. No, of course. Now we're I getting feel, too far afield. I feel <laughs> even then, even then, the companies will be like, oh, actually, we mm. can use less material for and make more of it. Mm. Good, uh, um, good, uh, good solution for them. But, mm. Um, so shall we shall we uh, circle back to your your predictions Prediction, yes, for chapter yes. one? So yeah. for my prediction, um, this is what I wrote down for myself. So this was chapter mm -hmm. one we just discussed, and I assumed at that point that the next thing that will happen to her is a further development in the experiments performed on her, mm -hmm. and I thought maybe that either a new character will be introduced. That would potentially know some information how to get the, out of the situation she is currently, or mm -hmm. she finds herself uh, awake. She finds herself awake during one of the uh, experiments and um, potentially run away from the um, the 
her confinement or for all her mm-hmm. captives. Because as often, you know, in books or movies, you see somebody during, suddenly waking up during the surgery and, you know, or whatever experiments happening on them and they, they run away from the um, from their captives. Mm. And I also thought that maybe her captive's identity will be exposed. So that was okay. my prediction mm. um, in from chapter one to the next chapter. And what do you think, okay, Richard? Then. I think I was pretty... These two predictions out of those three predictions, two of them were pretty close. Uh, yeah, I mean, fairly close. Um, I mean, we didn't see her wake up during any of the experiments. No, but, that's, uh, that, didn't that, happen. Yeah, that didn't yeah. happen. That didn't happen. But yes, we, we do... do find a bit out about her captor's identity. Yes, um, and, and uh, she does meet yeah. a new character, so hmm. it seems to be sort of a bit more, uh, a bit spot on. I don't want to uh, mm-hmm. uh, put yeah, yeah. on myself that's good. on the back too much. Mm-hmm. But... Yeah, yeah, I call that two out of three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so should, should, should we, we should move on to... count the points, how many times I was <laughs> correct or not, and then at the end... Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we should make a spreadsheet to keep track of that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> predictions correct incorrect and then at the end see how how good i was get I, or how yep. good or how bad i was getting with it as time was passing we'll <laughs> yep. make me see how much you should have been betting on that so you know you yeah. guys get, brace yourself <laughs> mm-hmm. uh so should i introduce okay. the chapter two then yeah let's let's do chapter two uh so in chapter two we find Lilith uh waking up herself uh, waking up again and finding herself mm-hmm. with uh the physical presence of one of the voices that she used to walk, talk to, one of her captors. Mm. And we find that the, her captor uh, um, came out uh, to speak to her um, to sort of introduce, well, to introduce her to what her situation really is. And as she sort of started it, converse with the, her captor she um, her the, the character uh, the other character um, mm-hmm. tried to uh, basically said to her that he wants her to see who he truly is and uh, when she's ready and once after a bit of a brief period of time she finally I don't know brings up the courage or finally calms herself down enough to approach the alien, uh, the alien, which in fact was an alien, and finds mm-hmm. herself in the presence of a humanoid-like uh, being. Um, the, the name of Dah- Dahia, I would say. This um, I think, so I have, I've listened to the audiobook versions of this, mm-hmm. so I have the pronunciations from, from that in my head. And in this, it's kind of a, um, a it's a Shtaya. Shtaya? Okay. Shtaya is it's- the, the way that it's, the narrator pronounces it. Okay, so uh, it's spelled J D A H Y A, but Chitaya. Yeah, okay. we'll say... it's kind of a soft J. Okay. Yeah. So Chitaya is yeah. a male alien, and I'm saying male with inverted commas because it's sort of how the way he says to her, um, he says that it's their sex sort of differences are not as similar, like are different to what humans are, but for her own understanding, hmm. he's a male. Yeah, and yeah. he was described as a slender man with no nose, no nostrils, just flat grey skin on his face and dark grey hair covering the whole head and face, neck and possibly the rest of his body. Hmm. Um, and we find that actually after a bit of a shock, we find that uh, the way he describes his hair is actually not the hair. When he asks her to come closer and realize that what, he's, what she sees is actually not hair but sensory organs. Hmm. Um, and we find out more about uh, Lilith's stay in the pri- imprisonment. We were told that she was on the ship because, um, in fact, she was c- captured on an alien ship for 250 human years. Yeah, that's a bit of a reveal. Yeah, yeah. and it's pretty crazy because when you think about 250 hmm. years for a human, a human body deteriorates to incredible speed. Um, from starting from age around 25 onwards and Hmm. um by age of 80 90 our bodies lack the possibility to sort of maintain the youthfulness you know our cells basically the process in our cells slow down there's a lot of errors being produced in dna 
we'll get to that mm. sorry the science later yeah. on but basically our bodies are not capable of standing such a long period so this is first sort of i think big sort of uh reveal of the capabilities those aliens have and yeah. so whatever that uh, whatever that stasis tech they used to put her to sleep is is uh pretty effective yes and in fact possibly yeah. the awakenings i would say may possibly also the surgeries performed on her potentially had some impact on that but hmm. i don't know yet we, we'll have to do we, get a, do we get a little bit more about the the surgery quote unquote that goes on I in this don't, section i don't think so okay i don't think so For, uh, yeah. i might have uh, i don't missed it but i don't think they go into that um hmm. i only uh only uh, uh, say again uh, what was his name uh, oh um uh, Chitaya. Chitaya. um Chitaya mm. told her only about how long she's staying and she he explained the situation that what's happening on earth um mm. which basically he said that during the war uh people were starting killing each other obviously and aliens were yep. observing this and in fact they didn't know what actually um uh, what it meant. It was novel to them. I mean, for a beings a bit more advanced than us, it, such a behavior was a bit less understandable. Mm. And they thought that we are basically undergoing a mass suicide um, event. Yeah, uh, I thought it was an interesting, which is uh, interesting thing aspect. for them to conclude. Right? Yeah, it's an interesting way because in a way, normal beings, other beings, right, um don't behave in a way like us but then hmm. we do well i say that we do have ant colonies that basically in america south america and australia that basically travel around and wipe each other up if the if they can but you know it's hmm. that's but it's interesting conclusion that um it was more as mass yeah. suicides here and i think that also caused the problem for the aliens when they ca- uh, they sort of rescued the rest of the humans, the remaining humans who were hiding against from the war, uh, from the war. Yeah, I think they, they they had like a debate of whether or not they should just rescue the humans because yes, they thought that yes. we were trying to kill ourselves. And I think it was also emphasized by by the fact that people who were captured by them eventually some uh, some of them committed suicide in their imprim- hmm. imprisonment cells. Um, um, but that also yeah, came pr- out from the fact because because of, of the, the solitary. Yes. Because of yeah. the solitude, yeah. it's the being this complete solitude yeah. again from anyone was mm. a big factor, and it took them a while to understand this uh, this concept. But yeah, it's clear, clear they uh, they um, kind of took a while to figure out how to keep like captive humans and <laughs> not have them go crazy and kill one another. Yeah, all I themselves. think it's uh, yeah. well. I can imagine being like having a new pet you never had before, and basically the pet. Just going crazy. I I think hmm. it was more like that for like that for them. Um, but what we are told about Chitaia is that um, the reason why they captured them was to help the Earth to recover, and then hmm. help them recover, heal them, and then send them back to Earth. But um, we know that you know it's it's a difficult process for to to mm. recover especially if you if you know for people injured and everything so and uh, sleeping or the uh, sleeping for people to preserve their lives to understand them took them 250 years yeah so it's um, quite a i think a long so what's period the state of, of the... time to, to 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 you know to study uh, psychological behavior of the species mm. um mm. And I suppose what's what's the state of the ecosystem down on Earth as well, right? That's a, how's, that's a good question. That that's a good question because yeah. if mm. um, I mean the book was written in 1986, so we assume obviously that of the author obviously was aware of nuclear bombs and because she was born after the Second World mm. War and she heard about yeah. it. And of course the Cold War and then the old uh, 1950s, 60s Americas, you no know, high bombs well, and missile crisis. Yeah, and... all of that. <laughs> So yeah. she must have been aware, and I assume that what this is what she was sort of referencing to that potentially oh, yeah, yeah. humans were using weapons of mass destruction, such as nuclear yeah. weapons that basically caused havoc on Earth, and that's why yeah. it potentially was also the reason why they were kept in uh, captivity for such a long period and to help the Earth to recover. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a 
a plausible alternate timeline, right? And if uh, Stanislav Petrov had, had a cold oh, yes. on, like, what, what was it? Like, the, I've forgotten the date, like 26th of September, 80. Three? Oh man, I can't remember. You are asking but, somebody yeah. who doesn't remember his birthday. <laughs> yeah, I'm terrible at it as well. But yeah, uh, but yeah, like it, that was a the Soviet missile commander who, um, like, decided not to report what was thought to be a missile launch from the US or ah, the yes, Soviet Union, the but error. was a yes, you're talking about the it was error. an error. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. and it was actually an error of a um. Uh, of of the computers of that time that they thought that was, uh, and I think it was a is like a in that particular case I can't remember exactly but I think it was a radar bug basically it like miscategorized something as a as a missile launch. Man, can you imagine um, being this close? Like literally, yep. A decision of There's one so many... man to basically yeah. annihilate the whole Earth. But there are so many stories like that, right? That there are several instances where we very nearly went full on thermonuclear war. Oh yes. But like, avoided it by a you know whisker. Uh, there was um, like uh, NORAD did the whole war games thing where they accidentally had a simulation running they thought was real, <laughs> um, and then there was um, they had a similar thing with radar. They had like a flock of birds they thought was a load of missiles. Um, I, I I just it it's, was... think about it. and to be honest, there is a book a friend of our, of mine from um, uh, talked about the, all the mistakes and close hmm. calls with atomic weapons and just atomic energy oh yeah yeah there was some um, com- command and control was one of them but there's a more recent actually just i think like might have been earlier this year late last year there was a republication of one that revisited the whole like nuclear command and control problems um, with an updated version. But um, to be honest, at this very point, a lot yeah. of the nuclear we- uh, weapons that are being kept by Russia and America are probably non-functional, being kept underground oh. for so long. I just feel like... Some of them. Some of them, but, definitely. I mean, I'm sure there's enough to wipe everybody anyway from yeah, the face of I mean, the planet, but still. We're still alarmingly close to that situation, yeah. right? You know, If um, the, the current president of the United States has a bad day, then um, there's not really any checks. Yeah, and I feel like the same with the president of Russia. It's just both of them are just... But anyway, let's leave the politics out of this and yeah. just move on maybe to uh, um, but, the, yeah. the storyline. So plausible alternate history yes. where something went less well yes. on the whole nuclear situation. We were, let's say it was less lucky Earth version. Yeah, yeah, marginally less lucky. And so in the storyline, we find that ah, um, uh, oh, I forgot his name again. My goodness. Oh, um, Shtaya. Shtaya. I need to yeah. write it down the, somewhere. The, the full name is. Uh, he gives a long one, doesn't it? It's like Kalted yes. Indajaya Lel Kaguyat Ajdinso. The meaning of which uh, we may get a bit more detail yeah he just later. tries it like yeah. it's being a um a full his full name is actually a combination of his i think parents and then some other things so yeah there's like a set of rules that determine what the full name is like, you know, patronymics in russian that kind of thing okay it's so we'll system probably we'll look into that we'll get to know about this more later on and Shdaya tells us about that in her first awakening awakening a little this uh, first awakening something went mm. wrong and she needed to be put asleep again. I think that describes in the big scar she found on her abdomen, if I remember the abdomen. Okay. Um, and as the conversation occurred, um, she asked about Sharad, obviously, because, you know. Hmm. And we find that another voice from uh, outside tells her that he's asleep with his family. And uh, when she asked to see him, um, he's fine. She was told that she will be able to see him, but only once she's able to. Ac- she accustoms herself to Chitaya and hmm. to the fact that there are more aliens like him outside, and she'll be able to walk peacefully without prejudice uh, around them. And that, yeah, that cause she, point is the she finds herself. Chapter. So sorry, what was that? And at the end, that's the uh, that sort of ended up the chapter. That's, and, uh, that yeah. that sort of information hmm. that. Once she's ready, then she'll be let out. Hmm. Yeah, because she, she finds herself kind of like viscerally terrified by 
just the physicality of this alien being is present, right? She's oh very, yes, I mean you know it's yeah. imagine seeing a human being thinking it's a human being, and then when you get mm. close, and as this is like what Daya actually said to her, um, to her mm. when other humans came uh, to meet him or all his co aliens. Um, yeah. They got really upset when they realized the hair is not actually hair, but more like Medusa, as she describes it, a, a living yeah, these, sort uh... of organism. And in fact, mm. Nick describes when he actually came close to sit down sort of beside her, the hair was sort of, he said that it can move to his own will and also his emotions and the environment. So... Mm. I can sort it of has imagine like it. sensory component to it as well. Yeah, so yes, I can uh, sort of imagine yeah. it being quite um, unsettling if you sat down with someone and suddenly their hair was just sort of pointing at you. It's just yeah, it's like being stuck in a room with like a kind of human-sized octopus type thing. Yeah, sort of like <laughs> a real life, a real life, a human li- uh, like Cthulhu. Uh, yeah, you know, staring. <laughs> so I can imagine the distress of, uh, of people. It's pretty disconcerting. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, As if you've ever been in a room with like, uh, I mean, I've not ever been in a room with an animal that was like really imposing because you know that would be a bad idea. But like, if you get the analogy when you go to the zoo and you stand like close to a tiger or something, right? It's kind of a large, bit bigger than human-sized animal oh, yeah. that's still very like. Yeah, you get that visceral sense of this is an intimidating physical entity, right? Yeah, I uh, which oh. I think in Bristol, right? Uh, mm-hmm. In the zoo in Bristol, um, the sort of um, animal cages for lions, particularly you mentioned lions, are open cages. Mm-hmm. They're not sort of you don't look at them. They're literally just a single mesh sort of separating you again from those animals and it is yeah. a great sign also saying that uh, uh, lions can pee like two meters or something to uh, when they march <laughs> so you have to be careful if they turn around so that's also uh yeah. there but actually it may you can feel that you get close mm. and suddenly a lioness appears out of nowhere just jumps near you and you're like Oh my god! So it, this sort of presence, yeah. like I can, it's really of, visceral. Yes, you can feel it. Yeah. So I can mm. imagine, like, in being in the presence of an alien, or co- being completely you no. Know, even though with games or movies or books or whatever, you just hmm. be introduced to many sort of imaginations of aliens. Still, yeah. they're on the screen. It's very hard. Yeah, it's hard to emulate the. The, the kind of all the little subtle cues that constitute actually physically being there yes um it, and it's... give you that impression that's kind of you know the, the skin standing up on your uh, extremities it's getting sensation goosebumps, basically thinking yeah. because you feel like you know it's it's as she was describing it like you can feel him looking at you but without eyes and you know hmm. for human Eyes, nose, mouth are like the more you know. You can miss you can miss an ear or something, but it's still hmm. oh, you you can miss anything on your face, and that will really make people stare at you. And it's not because they think you're weird; it's because yeah. instinctively in our minds something is yeah. wrong. And that like is the- facial recognition or seeing the pattern of a face is like really deeply in our kind of visual yes, programming yes. And of right? course, and we see faces everywhere yes exactly you know seeing yeah. faces and piece of toast or whatever it's just like mm. it's 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 so ingrained in us because it's important for our self-preservation and protection and yeah. it's just incredible like you know how you know and people stare at people missing some features because it's just mm. unsettling it's not that they oh, yeah. Um, yeah. want to, or it's not that they're being ru- mm. like rude. Obviously, staring is rude. Because yeah, right? it, but you know that that like subconscious heuristic bit of your brain that does the facial recognition just has a like oh, what? Uh, is there any it danger? Gets tri- it gets tripped up like, is on there any the. Danger around you? The, what yeah. caused it? What could be the cause? How can I sort of um, mm. bypass? How can I know what was the danger to mm. bypass it? Also, never be uh, never yeah. count in this myself. So, in, instead of you know doing the normal automatic thing of categorizing stuff is in a background kind of stuff it, it it you know throws a this is a weird thing i can't categorize this so it gets promoted to the level of conscious attention you get like a oh this is 
that's something I should notice. Yes, um, yes, exactly. But, yeah, and it's it yeah. sort of like gives you the oh the shock you you stand you know mm. it's like the uh, fight or flight you no know, um the adrenaline starts to build up in your body you're like oh okay this is this is not what it should be and I wanted mm. to talk about a bit of the sensory organs present on Jedaya because I thought yeah we could sort of reference it to um sort of the science or the nature we observe in our world and okay. I think although difficult to sort of characterize something like that hmm. um i think there are some sort of animals um uh, examples uh, of such sort of sensory organs in um in our world uh, most yeah. probably famous examples would be gastropods snails and slugs hmm. like you oh, yeah. you have their eyes are sort of um, those, those tentacles they come out from the top of their head yeah, the stalks um, the stalks are more they act, there's a very similar to that They're because they act very uh, you know because what Daya says is basically he can see he can sense mm. everything through it you know smell sort of uh, I don't know about taste it didn't say but he can it reacts to his emotions so yep. there is definitely a nervous system associated with that um, yeah. and I, I mean smell and taste are you know very related yes right? exactly so, so potentially it would be similar. also related mm. though the um, digestive system can be separated it, has, hmm. it hasn't described it yet, but I, I have some theories about that. Um, mm -hmm. But basically, the gastropod sensory organs can act as olfactory, so smell, and mm -hmm. then visual, balance, and mecha mechanical receptors. So they can feel the touch mm -hmm. or whatever it changes in environment, movement of environment. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But they don't and have a sense of hearing. Yeah. And we know that yeah. he can hear her even though he doesn't have ears. So those organs mm. that on his um, body can act of all of those. So yeah. it's yeah. I think it's very interesting, a very advanced sort of organ that he can control mm. and also that also reacts to the environment. And mm. um, it makes you think that it's like as if, you know, we had an eyes... Because it was described as in a whole body, so he can sense the environment mm. in his whole body, meaning that it might be also quite sensitive to changes in the environment. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a this could be also related to things like um, um, there's the other examples of uh, organs like this, such as um, tentacle-like sensor organs in star. Uh, What's the name? Star no smalls. Star no smalls. Yeah. yeah. So these are mm. just mechanical receptors, um, mm -hmm. but they are very, very sensitive. It's probably the most sensitive mechanical receptors you can find in whole, in any mammal. Hmm. And isn't um, isn't the star no small or a relative of it where they they hold like a bubble of air in that? Yes, um, yes, yes. Because they actually thing, and they, go um, they actually um, are a bit more of uh, water-based animals as well they like a mm. wet environment where can they can find food but because they are so sensitive um to um to so sensitive to the environment um mm. it's it's incredible so how you know it's that they can detect a minuscule movement of a earthworm mm. i think is, we're talking about i don't want to lie i know this may be mm. correct but i think mm. from what i remember it was several hundred meters probably overstatement but uh, i'm sure it's that seems like a long way but i th but uh, i think it's quite a substantial distance hmm. is that as purely a mechanical I th thing I, from what i or does it have some kind of electro perception um yeah. i think it's fully it's only mechanical receptor although it has a um a uh, organ called imus uh, organ and that but i it, it, i'm not entirely totally certain if it's elec also re it detects electromagnetic changes uh, okay yeah because uh -oh. i know things like um the duckbill platypus and hammerhead sharks and a few oh, other yes, things yes of course have they, very they can detect electromagnetic refined, changes uh electromagnetic yeah, field changes electrical senses um mm -hmm. but this i don't know it, I would have to look into it more. Uh, I'll find yeah, some references yeah. on Iron but I, I, I suppose um, starfish might be another um, creature that has sort of tentacle-like structures with 
multi-sensory functions. Oh, yes, yes. Absolutely. Although they're kind of a bit more in the olfactory, chemosensory kind of uh, space. Yeah, um, I mean, we have a lot of the cephalopods as well. Oh, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. by all of this. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of examples. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of them have different functions. I'm curious mm -hmm. how later uh, um, they will explain this sort of uh, how they portray, because we know there are some animals like the um, prawn, if I remember, that can see ultraviolet light, that has like the best mm. developed eyes. It's the one, I don't know, I probably oh, yes, know the, the name um, of it, but uh, it's the one that shoots yeah, the bubble yeah. so quick, it kills the um, mm. fish. Fly. Yeah, I know, I know what you're talking about, and it, um, I've forgotten the name of the thing. Um, I don't remember. But it's. But this is this. It can also see polarized light. Yes, yes. It can tell the difference between, uh, and even differences between like circularly and linearly polarized light. It's, um, it's, mantis shrimp. Yes, mantis shrimp. Yes, that's, that's the one. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. It's eyesight. It's hmm. so. It's probably the most developed eyesight that you, you can find in nature, and it's incredible. Hmm. And I would like to hear more about those sensory organs. What exactly do they do? You know, later on, hmm. maybe somebody, maybe they yeah, will so, describe it, but. They seem like they have uh, a very, you know, a very highly capable sensory uh, organ system, um, but the precise parameters of that are yet to be uh, examined. Yeah, so yeah. I hope, hope in the next future chapters they will talk about it because I'm really curious. And you know, hmm. having that many sensory organs, I had this thought which I wrote down here for myself in notes mm -hmm. that I was just wondering if their nervous system is centralized. Because you know, uh. development of a brain in the, in the Earth mm. evolution was important because it um, allowed for development of identity and mm. for a better processing of uh, information, and memory, and stuff like that, character, speech, you know. And you can tell that you know with the difference between our humans and then our ancestors and you know uh, more, uh, chimpanzees and all those primate primates and all other other animals that have centralized uh, are you could say superior in the um uh I suppose the information aggregation yes, yes, right yes. the kind of ability to act as a yes and process a, the information a, a, an agent in the environment that centralized information yes and uh, in different animals of course yeah. that's brains is the brains are developed less or uh, more depending on you know at the mm. stage of their evolution yeah. but i was just wondering yeah. like the amount of sensory information provided by um uh you know all those tentacles if all of those tentacles on his body provide the same sort of information or whether he has areas that you know mm. have different specialization. Areas, specialization and certain you know that'll be it still is not described whether those sort of um amount of sensory information you are given like does it need maybe more sort of like brains in him like some sort of like mm. no because our brain is ba uh, built of two sort of parts the the old brain the cerebellum which is responsible for the basic functions that are not consciously co controlled like heartbeat mm -hmm. breathing you know all of that whereas the cerebrum is where everything else is happening the the sort of um, memory, you know, processing of your high, level, high functions. level functions, basically. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I can imagine it being having maybe one brain, like the big, uh, you know, main high function brain, but then smaller sort of nodes controlling the rest of the sort mm -hmm. of reactions. And the, the there is like, um, you know, a body size to brain size relationship, right? So, you know, the blue whale has a much bigger brain than us, but it's not necessarily a lot smarter than us because it's got a lot of a lot more you know stuff to supervise right yes There's the rest yes. of the whale that needs some attention um from the brain uh yeah so that's but is uh, the i mean is the whale's um brain um with what is it then related to because you know is it the amount of the concentration on the neuron cells per volume or is it because uh, or is it um down to the I'm not sure um because i mean no, the, we know that brain how many times you you know the brain folded is uh, the way it's folded is for the reason um ah, yes. it's mm, yeah. it's developed mm. this way to increase the volume uh, them you know its volume surface area to surface mm. area and you know having more mm. brain cells to to for you know for processing for function um, but that's why when you look in some brains that are very sort of smooth and there's there are some cases yeah, of a, 
um, brain um, uh, disabilities that uh, humans are born due to certain mutations. The brain is very smooth. The concentration, yeah, of, the concentration of neuron cells is much lower compared to what a standard normal human being would be born with without any disabilities. So it's it's interesting uh, i wonder they yeah, are described the... uh, Taya was described as a big taller humanoid that compared to lilith um but mm. yeah, they're quite physically big but let's mm. see I, i'm curious on the intrinsic uh, interesting sort of further knowledge on the author sort of provides for us to understand yeah. better yeah. learning a bit more about their uh, capabilities their biological capabilities yes, yes, yeah absolutely mm. I'm really excited to be honest. It's really exciting. I, 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 I to ever to all the listeners, I, I, you can probably tell, but I am really mm. excited about this. I, I generally, when first Richard introduced this book to me, I was wow, this is really something interesting because we can talk about this for a long time, and you know we do possess enough knowledge to understand certain aspects, and of course we look into more sort of preparation. But like, it's, it's an interesting topic, and it drives me really uh sort of not insane but like i wish that sort of we were able to understand more of be able to meet all the sort of aliens like that in the future like mm. maybe in, uh, depend on like whether the you know if we're not alone on this world or maybe where the distances are so f- you know they were so spread that we maybe never meet but yeah and of course like one of the big questions with respect to the origin of life and, and, and biology and you know aliens and so on it's like to what degree if aliens exist will they be biologically different to oh, us yes. like how much of the kind of abiogenic process by which you know chemicals gave rose to life processes is is deterministic and how much of it is probabilistic it's, it's, you know chance this is the good question because yeah. there was an experiment mm. performed on um providing like recreating the environment of what the you know primal soup uh when uh, yuri miller again the yuri miller experiment uh, i don't remember his name to all this yeah i think it's, i am it's awful, a hyphenated uh comes names and dates so probably rich will remember everything because he has a mind on the eh. computer but <laughs> mm. but i remember general I have terrible things, memory for so dates just bear in mind mm. with me um, so there was an experiment performed where they pr- reproduced the sort of environment, the uh, co- concentrations of sort of the uh, ammonia, carbon dioxide, and the electricity going yeah. through there, and then basically left the chemical, uh, like the, the reagents of those chemicals to their own sort of, let's say, life, like just for them yeah, to yeah. react they, they... Or, uh, spontaneously. and Put them in the reaction vessel with some atmosphere and some electrical um, stimulation to simulate you know, lightning, uh, and, then the lightning basic, and other electrostatics in the uh, area. Behavior yeah. and then basically just mm. left them for a period of time and then they came back to them yep. after a certain period of time. I remember that I watched the documentary and they looked into I think some tubes that like 10 years later and they found yeah, yeah. actually the first amino acids um, Yep. Uh, and I think some might be some nucleotides in there as yes, well. Yes, yes, yes. In fact, yes. But, and it, it yeah. showed that Potentially, if the uh, if the life um, develops on other planets, hmm. it may not be the way you know look the same as we do because we you know the way we hmm. evolved. But if you look around the world, like I mean, we have there's so many different species in different way the way they will look. You know, there's an hmm. infinite uh, possibility to for them to develop. But potentially, the chemistry, the biochemistry, hmm. will be very similar. Uh, so there's a uh... Like the, we have a kind of fundamental overlap with all the rest of the, oh yes, you know, the tree of life yes. on Earth, right? Because there's, you know, going back to to Luca, last universal common ancestor. Like we, we have the same um, genetic code. So like the mapping between the sequence of bases and the sequence of proteins is the same, but that could be arbitrary, right? So the 
that which bases are in our DNA might be different, like, and then what those encode in terms of the proteins they produce could be different, and whatever, yes. which amino acids include could exactly. be different, and also handedness, right? The chirality could be different, right? So everything is is um, ah yes, because the yes, absolutely, because we have L sort of the left. We're all L, right? The, the yeah. left sort of pro- um, uh, I'm proteins, but where it could be completely reversed. It's interesting, yeah. but mm-hmm. then there are some limitations with that as well. Please remember that some some of the protein behavior, the chirality, which we'll probably have to explain in more details. Um, uh, basically, it's just handedness. Yeah, right? how, it's, so, you know, imagine you, your hands, uh, you have left and right hands, yeah. sort of imagine mm. the protein being the same, basically, that it can it's be... A, the, the amino acid, the analogous concept, right? The, the, the individual units that are strung together to make up proteins are structured in such a fashion that they can, um, like, then you can't um, rotate them such that they will be the same, right? They're, yes, they're reflected yes. in a you mirror, cannot, effectively. Yeah, if right? you rotate it, you cannot impose it on the on the other protein. So, yeah, it's yeah. And everything in life is is L-handed or or labor rotatory. Um, uh, and but it could be D, mm-hmm. right? If everything yes, was absolutely. dextro rotatory, then it would be the you know everything would be a mirror image. Um, or like, well, there's a couple of exceptions in like bacterial cell walls where where D is used, but um, yeah. But I think also so that's there's a seemingly arbitrary choice. I think if I remember correctly, back to my undergrad chemistry, is that some of the chemistry mm. behind L and D is actually some things can only happen on the L proteins. I but I think it's down to the enzymes and also the vamps. But anyway, mm. yeah. so I like the folding would be all screwed up if you mixed in the different. Oh yes, um, yes, yes. yes. Uh, so yeah. this this is what we sort of um, imagine that this it may be very similar in a similar sort of idea, you know, a four base or maybe six base or whatever yeah. um, DNA. The individual chemical constituents might be the same, but the way in which they're organized could be very different. Yes, absolutely. So yeah. um, it's something that we have to um, bear in mind that in with, if we meet any sort of if we ever meet in next century or millennium uh or hmm. beings from other worlds potentially will uh, if we even find any sort of bacteria like organisms um uh, it might be the case that their genomic uh composition is completely is very similar but completely not the way our uh, life has evolved yeah yeah um and it, it's one of the interesting ones in what we, if we ever find uh, like fossil bacterial life on Mars, right? If it's a different um, fundamental uh, chemistry, or you know has a different genetic code or something, then that would be you know that would say you know we've got two independent origins of life effectively, yes. um, but with still very similar chemical compositions, just different like um, uh, choices for the. Um, the specific implementation of, of genetic information it's i yeah. think it's a very in- incredible and interesting topic to talk uh, to think about because it's hmm. if we considered that we that uh, let's say the life on other planets or well, let's say hmm. is using the same building blocks again yeah but there are some changes associated to how many for example bases uh, in DNA or RNA mm. or um, DNA is in deoxyribonucleic acid, which is the basis in our cells that how we look and how we who we are is the basic you know the basics block basic blocks, and RNA is the sort of equi- equi- no, equivalent of it, but used to create proteins. Um, the DNA and RNA could be made of more than four bases. Uh, it could be yeah, which would kind of rule out cross compatibility with our yes, systems exactly. to I mean, a significant it's, degree. It's, yep. I think if it's to be dissimilar or if this it's the same sort of building blocks, I still think it would be so different that hmm. um, yeah. we wouldn't be able to re- to relate it in any way. Yeah, so you often get that like, you know, alien virus scenario in sci fi. Oh, yes, yes. Right. Where are like, mm, nah. Like viruses are incredibly highly specialized to exploit 
like the existing very specific yes, systems that yes, exist yes. in the cells of the host organism right if they get if they're going to be off at a fundamental level like with, with base pairs or whatever that's really not going to be that's not going to work right uh, so I, the, the possibility of cross compatible pathogens strikes me as like mm, unless we're really similar that's yeah, I not going to be a thing. But there, there are, for example, organisms that um, we find, and recently, you know, originally, well, if our, our lovely listeners, when if you if you remember your classes from primary school and biology about the kingdoms, you know, kingdom plant, kingdom animal, mm-hmm. king, you know, nowadays actually those kingdoms are actually spreading more and more. We find more examples of beings or organisms. Uh, usually microscopic. They're not. Uh, we're not, I'm not talking about actually big. I'm talking about microscopic bac- bacteria-like uh, organisms that mm. have completely um, different um, genes or genomic sequence uh, compared to any other. Mm. Um, yeah. Although we did, we did have that kind of high-level consolidation into the three domains, right? So we had the five kingdoms, but then we. You know, there's the bacteria, the archaea, and then the eukaryotes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and then we've got more kingdoms beneath that level where um, we have a better picture of kind of the, the topology. Of absolutely, the, the but tree it's now. like a tree. But, it keeps yeah. spreading and mm. we still find mm. new branches that basically don't match what we have so far. And it's yeah. pretty, and I, I feel like it's going to be like that. That the, the tree, I would say the the Yggdrasil of the Norse mythology of 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 you know of kingdoms is gonna be spreading mm. more and more. And if we find something that it doesn't match, and you know, completely yeah. any of those three kingdoms, well, that's gonna probably revolutionize everything. Our knowledge and, and yeah, totally different. Um, you know, a totally different tree, right? A totally different root because you know everything in on Earth has that common history yes. whereas you know something else would be you know totally different and lack the cross compatibility although i say to, i make a point about pathogens but allergens and toxins definitely a thing mm. right we could definitely see that being a an issue although it, it's a kind of interesting case with the whole allergens thing you probably have like an an uncali valley type problem where stuff would be sufficiently alien that it won't be reacted to Sometimes, well, it depends. or there I mean, might be stuff you know, that's if, if, just if you think of, similar enough. If you think about like ions and everything, you know, it's all those things. There might be common things that basically maybe, well, if like an alien bacteria invaded your body, and it hmm. would potentially use some of the basic components uh, present in your body to, yeah. to sort of. I suppose it's a question of like whether or not the enzymes that are evolved to break down the kind of stuff that you find in life on this planet would be sufficiently chemically compatible with whatever the other you know the whole like you know l and d amino acid yes, thing right yes. is, is is one of these proteases going to be compatible with a you know totally different set of amino acids or a totally different chirality of those amino acids it might not be able to but then i'm talking down about simple, and feed on our stuff simple, like elements like about elements yeah. simplest compounds you know like when you get right down to the the stuff that's already kind of the the monomers yes, that make exactly. up the various so biological polymers, that might be, then it could be that might be yeah. similar or it might be in a way utilizable. Uh, yeah, I, I suspect like my sort of personal guess, right? You know, it's not really informed by the science. Is that the a lot of the fundamental monomers will be the same? Yeah. Like, uh, like uh, even potentially like the the choice of amino acids and the choice of nuclear bases might well be determined by chemical factors but the um the organizational stuff is a bit more contingent yeah i think yeah. In, you know if we consider although i remember um i don't know if it was a doctor who or something talking about silicon based life you know we have we're talking about carbon based life mm. right but i think it was dr who was talking yeah. about silicon silicon based yeah, life it's, was it it's a possibility yes. um, but basically I'm you know skeptical. maybe maybe some um uh, elements um from this you know from the same column of the of on the periodic table under carbon could be utilized for um 
or maybe other elements might be building basically it's it's a topic that we could talk about hours and hours onwards and we probably never came to a conclusion because unfortunately we probably mm. never will meet such a being in our lifetimes yeah probabilistically it's not all that likely that we're going to overlap at least with the current numbers on the drake equation i think it makes me a bit sad That's, but at the same time yeah. it's a bit horrifying there's too, I've watched too many aliens movies to uh, to 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 look forward <laughs> to them as well. I mean, unless there's a full yeah. confinement, and then we can talk. But mm. no, I'm gonna commit the fallacy of generalizing from fiction. Yeah, right? yeah. And they they might yeah, be nice. Maybe nice. Oh, they you know maybe not. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, you know, if a higher being, hmm. I mean, let's be honest. We humans are usually nice to each other. There are some human beings that are not. Some other human, some yeah. human beings like yeah. to use other human beings or other beings. Hmm. So I think it will be the same I mean, with it, aliens. Like, to be fair, I mean the, the evidence from like colonialism, oh, yeah. right? When a massive asymmetry in technological capability exists, and the high tech people show up at the lower tech people, it ends poorly okay. for the low tech people. Yes. Um, yeah, so that that could go badly if. <sighs> So, te- more sophisticated see. aliens show up. Let's hope that our alien <laughs> alien overlords are nice to us. Yes. Uh, uh, hmm. Hmm. Oh, on that on that point, so do you think these particular alien overlords are being nice? Well, I think to, uh, so far, if what uh, yes. Daya said is true, that they were trying to save, because what they described was that they observed many different species performing similar, like wars and killing hmm. each other and you know, the mass suicide that they're describing it it feels to me and then they were trying to save and they're trying to save the humans and putting them back on earth it feels to me that potentially they are nice but as I talked we just I just said right now there might be some nice aliens that are trying to help mm-hmm. or they might be not so nice they're trying to utilize it who knows but I think hmm. so far what we see the approach is that it seems like it's more of a an experiment to understand so that they can help us. And I hope this is going to stay like that. <laughs> Although, you know, then <laughs> okay, if it's just, you know, like, oh, hi, you know, you know, Lilith gets used to them and then, like, they send Earth and it's like, okay, bye. I mean, the book would be like, you know, three chapters. And we know there's a whole trilogy yeah, of... So. Uh, no, sorry, there's a series of those books. So, uh, yeah, trilogy, it's a trilogy. Yeah. So, yeah, so definitely we'll, hmm. it's going to be... Uh, more stories of also say so i i think it'd probably be 50 50 on that okay uh, do, do you have a do you want to the go prediction? for your other predictions yeah, sure. yeah so yeah. i thought um these were my predictions that the next chapter mm-hmm. we'll f- see that um lilith will get slowly used to Chidaya and until she's ready to leave and mm-hmm. the moment she leaves the sort of her confinement she will have a shock seeing how many aliens there are with some humans uh, mingling with them, you know, it's be seeing mm-hmm. other humans actually and meeting maybe other humans that are already used to, uh, or she may be on her own, who knows, but I think it will be already humans there. And okay. I'm sure what's gonna happen is that Daya will show what the because when he said it's the on the ship, right, it's yeah. easier for her to understand, but in that mm-hmm. sort of way, he said it sounds like there's gonna be more into that. There's going to be more okay. information behind it. And I feel like potentially he, it, the ship is not just a ship and she, he will explain and show her more around the ship and then she will probably meet the leader of his race or sort of like the yeah. whatever. Who, Take me to your leader. Yeah, yeah, sort of like, you know, <laughs> she'll be introduced to the rest of her, of his kind. Okay. Hmm. So, yeah, good speculations. So let's see. And yes. on that note, shall we introduce our um, uh, readers to the sorry listeners to the next mm-hmm. chapter uh, to look forward to the next sort of podcast uh, on chapter three, maybe chapter yeah, four, depending I, I how we, long they are. We'll, we'll probably do chapters three and four, okay, and then um, five might get its own. I've just looked over the lengths, uh-huh. and that uh, five's a, a lot longer, so uh, that's. Uh, probably the way we'll go and th- those chapters represent the first section womb um or part one um and then chapter numbers start over again in in part two uh, so, uh, so we will con- we'll, so this is, these are chapters one and two of uh section one 
titled Womb, Womb. from mm-hmm. the book Dawn of Xenogenesis um, series by Octavia L. Butler. And mm-hmm. we hope you've enjoyed listening to us. Um, it is an experience for me, for definitely. Yeah, it's a, this is our, our, our first time doing this, and so, uh, so we'll see how it goes. And we'll try to provide as many references as we can to what we talk to about. If not, you can easily find things about yep, what we talk uh, on Wikipedia. And there's li- links in the description. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, on whatever podcast service you are listening to us on. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. And see Thank you. you. And, hear uh, you soon. Indeed. Goodbye. Bye.